Welcome back to our second segment of Community Tapestry. And if you're just joining us, once again, my name is Napoleon Bell, and I'm the Executive Director of the City of Columbus Community Relations Commission. We have Miss Tony Bell. <laughs> is that right? Yeah, Ms. it's Tony got a Bell? good ring to it. Got a good ring. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Pun intended. Right, right. So uh, <laughs> we are here on our second segment. We had a great first segment, and uh, uh, we're going to continue the greatness of, of our guests mm -hmm. um, here uh, with Community Tapestry, and we're, we're looking forward to having a conversation um, because what we're trying to, to also look at is um, in, in, in our community and, and nationally in regards to how race and ethnicity impact, you know, our, was decisions. Impact, uh, our decisions now and, and, and before Critical and going thinking. forward. Um, and, then, and then what's being done, in, you know, in mm -hmm. some of the schools around, around the, 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 the state, um, but then also um, some of the events that we have coming up too. Right, that, to bring awareness it. and inclusion and give people an opportunity to just kind of debrief from what's going on and just celebrate, enjoy one right. another. Right, and how, and how do we come together? So yeah. I'm looking forward to this conversation. So let's start the conversation. And so I'd like to introduce to my left, I have Mr. Thomas Caps, and he's the Diversity Peer Educator and Marketing Coordinator mm -hmm. within the Department of Global Diversity and Inclusion at Columbus State Community College. Did I get that right? You got it. All right, all right. I'd like to welcome you to the program. Thank you. And then across the table, we have Mr. Jamal Bell. He's the Director of Strategic Communications and Film, and also uh, the, what, what within the Kerwin Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnicity at The Ohio State University. Yes. I get that out. Yes, you did. <laughs> All right. We, we got both of those out, and we're so glad okay. to, to, to have you on board here Thank to you. really have this discussion mm -hmm. and uh, uh, looking forward to it. So first of all, I, you know, we, we went left to right, so let me just start with, with, with uh, Thomas Caps. Can I call you Tom? Absolutely. All right. All right. We'll start all with Tom. All my friends call me. All right. Great. <laughs> well, we're, we're quick friends here then. Yes. Uh, uh, Tom, let me ask you this, you know, um, because first of all, you know, at Columbus State, could you give us a little bit of background? on what a diversity peer educator is, but also what your department does there at Columbus State Community College. Absolutely, uh, Global Diversity and Inclusion uh, started out as um, just a couple programs, but over the last couple years has really grown into a true department. Um, a diversity educator, peer educator, is someone um, that is a student first, um, and then becomes a work-study position um, and begins working in that department. Um, the reason that that position is so important is because you're able to understand both sides of the fence. You understand working with the students and being a student, and you also understand working at the college and working with administration. Um, so it's really important uh, balance, and it's something very specific um, that we've come up with to try to, to tune in to that. Um, but within the department itself, um, we've come up with a lot of different programs to not only help in uh, educating the students, but help educating the campus and the community because we are a community college. Okay. Um, so we have a bunch of different programs. Um, one of them is Pono. It's something to, um, it's a learning community. It's there to help people learn and expand on different cultures, um, learning from one another at the table together, kind of a conversation, and it goes through the whole uh, semester. The next is MAN Initiative. Um, it started out as primarily a African-American male retention program. Um, it was our highest dropout rate. Um, so we wanted to focus on that and try to, what's missing? What, what can, how can we fix this? And it's kind of gone to that point and now it's expanded to all men um, on campus and it has a scholarship and um, we focus on making sure that the needs that they ha have are, are met. Um, launching this semester is the Women's Connection, oh, which wow. is the, um, not the women's version of that, but a women's sector for women students and administrators on campus to come together and learn from one another, learn about leadership, learn about self-confidence, and expand on those things. Um, so we're looking forward to that because that launches this semester. Um, Columbus State Leadership Society. It has been uh, in place for quite a long time, but um, it started with a conference where someone said, you want to be a leader, how do, we, how do we do that here on campus? And so um, they launched a society where every semester students can come in and, and learn about leadership skills. Um, and our department specifically focuses on the second um, sector and focuses on diversity, leadership and diversity. Um, and then the last program, of course, is the um, Safe Zone program, which is the LGBTQ training, um, not just for students again, but also for the entire campus. Um, and I said last, but uh, there's one more that's very important. Uh, the Dream Network, which is our focus on international students as well as DACA students. Um, it's a focus that um, 
President Obama really brought up a lot this uh, year. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to make sure that our students were represented and that were informed and educated. So I that's see. what that's there for. You said DACA students. What, what, what is DACA students? Um, deferred action. Um, so it's students who have um, maybe their, they have different scenarios, but maybe their parents came here um, to, be, to, be, to live here at some point, um, and they've been here since 13. Um, at least, um, and this is their home, so um, they live, work, and go to school here, and so they apply for DACA status um, in order to be here to work and go to school. That's a lot of wonderful programming. Yes. I don't know how you keep track of it all, but it's, <laughs> it's, it seems like something that's very all-encompassing, and you continue to morph as you, as you meet the needs of the community. Things change every day, so we try to, to morph with it. That's good. Thank you. How, how do you stay on top of that? I mean, you know, as Columbus is, you know, a, a, a hugely diverse city and, and continuing yes. to grow. Yes. Um, how how does? Because it sounds like your office has to be on top of this to yes. be able to create the programs and to really adjust according to. Uh, who all is coming in here to the city of Columbus? Absolutely. Um, it's not an easy task, but it's one that we, as again, I said, a community college, we have to be focused in on, on the community. And um, Columbus is so diverse that we take surveys um, on campus. We do lots of workshops, um, lots of leadership programs, lots of things to where we can ask the student um, and the people who work on campus, what is missing? And then when they tell us what's missing, we do our best to find a piece to put it in there and, and connect the dots so that everyone's uh, happy mm -hmm. and everyone's represented and everyone um, feels connected to one another. Mm -hmm. That's what really truly makes a community. So speaking of connection, you also have a connection with Co Columbus State Community College and The Ohio State University. How Absolutely. What is that connection? Uh, well, one is that um, for me personally, I'm a student at both universities, um, but also in the, the department, we have a long time relationship um, that we have had with uh, the OSU um, so that we can, during the Martin Luther King celebration, partner together and bring in someone who is a notable individual in the, either um, the light of view today, but also in the civil rights movement, um, past and present. And we've all, we've partnered with them, I think, for the last at least 25 years. So, I mean, that's a strong partnership that we've had for a long time. So when you came to Columbus State Community College as a student, mm -hmm. is this what you envisioned yourself doing? Absolutely not. <laughs> I worked um, in corporate financing for six years. Um, I came to Columbus State uh, when I moved to Columbus, and I actually Many people told me in the city, you want to figure out what you want to do. Columbus State is a place to go and really to discover yourself. And that was uh, nothing but true. Um, I started there as a volunteer, and uh, I started a student group called Cougars for the Community, which focuses on students and uh, campus and community of Columbus coming together and doing volunteer work. And that led into someone saying, hey, you should come work with us. So um, it's been a great journey, and it's, it's, I love it. <laughs> great, great. Well, let's make this transition because, especially with with Al Sharpton, I think I think this makes a, a great transition, and also mm -hmm. to to the Ohio State University and and what oh, you. I'm not done. I'm sorry, I had to say it. <laughs> right. I had to say it. Right, and that by that time we'll know. We will we'll, have won. We'll, yeah, exactly yes. right. Thank you. Um, so let me let me turn it to Jamal Bell. Love your last name. Just want to make make tell you, tell you that. But uh, we, we might be. We might be related. <laughs> we might be related. Well, right. You never know. We're all related in some, some way. Exactly <laughs> right. So tell us a little bit about um, what what goes on and, and why the Kerwin Institute was established, but and, and how long is I know it's been around a, a long time, but. But, but what all happens there at the Kerwin Institute? Well, so the Kerwin Institute has been around since 2003. Um, I guess, and I wasn't here then, I didn't come in until 2009. But I will say, from my memory, the Kerwin Institute started from um, uh, different colleges around the university coming together to start an institute. One of the original goals were to, were to have, uh, was to have, um, Better retention with better retention and recruitment uh, for uh, African American um, professors, uh, but also to have uh, space where there's study, space where um, professors can get grants and study race and ethnicity. But over the years, it just started to grow into doing more engaged research, research inside communities, and um, that's where I came in. That's when I came in when when they were really deep into doing engaged community research with focus on marginalized communities. Um, and, you know, and 
they just had, and you know, we just have this uh, high quality of looking and um, to deepen the understanding of the causes and the solutions uh, to racial and ethnic disparities just to bring about a society that's fair and just for all. And so we, so basically we want our research to be used inside of those communities, whether that's through policymakers, whether that's through um, um, justice advocates, whether that's through uh, grassroots organizations. Um, we don't do research with the expectation that it sits on a shelf. It's the expectation of it being used. So we don't spend a lot on publishing <laughs> mm -hmm. because okay. it's like here, we just printed it out. Here's a PDF, g work it. You need, you. yeah. You, if you need help working it, we can help you work it, and um, so that's been really our push, mm -hmm. is not to not for any of our research to just sit and look pretty and to be archived. Is to be used. Is to be um, used effectively, and and that's really our mission and goal. Well, you know, with that research, and, and I'm sure you go back uh, so many years, even prior to when you're established, but the research would would do that. What do you see when we look at um, racism and uh, affecting our nation? And I don't know if you guys drill down to, to the city in a sense, but what is the research showing you know, from 50 years ago to now? What, what, what are we looking like there uh, through research? Well, I would say first that the research shows that it still exists. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's just, uh, that's the basic. But, um, but you know, like uh, the, Using you know the 50 year as a mark, you know we've been doing that lately the past few years because of all the historical markers with the Civil Rights Act. Um, I think one of the th yeah yeah all of that, and I think one of the things that um, the question that always comes up is, are we better off? You know, 50, you know, uh, are we better off today than um, 50 years ago? That is such a tough question to answer because. I mean, well, bottom line, we've had major sacrifices in advocacy over the past decades that have produced great success for all people. You know, like the Civil Rights Act, 24th Amendment, Voting Rights Act, Fair Housing Act, Equal Opportunity Employment. However, there seems to always be a strategy that undermines that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, an easy example is just our mass incarceration system today. Um, you know, we had slavery. We abolished slavery with the 13th Amendment. The counterplay was chain gangs, black codes, and Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. Chain gangs were outlawed, except for in Georgia. Then we had the Civil Rights Act. Then we got a drug war. And then the reinstitution of chain gangs and prisoner labor. Thus, we have mass incarceration and we have advocates and policymakers trying to figure that out. So, yeah, we've made some progress, but it seems that there's always a strategy that undermines the progress. And, um, and that's probably the most discouraging is when we see progress, there's this undermining of it. So when you, when you say strategy, are you thinking of there are a few conspirators that have you know, decided to come together and make some policies, or tell me what you mean by the strategy. Drug war was a policy. In order to create policy, there's a strategy. Um, um, you know, deciding to have federal, or deciding to have prisons um, private is a strategy. It's not by accident, so. Do you see that as a strategy aimed at disenfranchised communities. So I, I mean, I'm, I'm asking this mm -hmm. really direct question because, yeah. um, because not only do you have research, but you've got you know, some passion behind it. Do you see this as a strategy to, to, to just constantly, consistently keep underprivileged, disenfranchised groups out? Or do you think that it's a, it's a happenstance of we decided we were going to privatize. Somebody had a strategy, but this is just what ended up happening to this group of people. I think that is very, that can be very hard to answer and to say that research 100% back the claim because sometimes uh, you have a lot of dog whistles and dog whistle politics where they where there's certain. I guess you could say there's certain words, certain terms that people use to trigger something else. So instead of saying, um, and you know, instead of like for instance in the '60s they talked about, uh, you know, they talked about states' rights, and that was to, and that was the dog whistle, cold word for, we want to have our segregation when we want it. We don't want to have, um, 
um, black kids in our in our schools. I mean, but they use code words as states' rights. So it's hard to put that in the research because of the code words. People know what they mean, but getting someone to say it straight up, you so know, so. Does, does that make the work of the Kerwin Institute that much more important? Then? And difficult, yes. Dif it's important and Im difficult. Important and difficult because, you know, one of the things that we're going to get into is the implicit bias angle that goes into this. Um, and I'm not the expert on implicit bias. This is why we're a research institute and um, we have <laughs> researchers behind it. But um, I, I would say that, uh, you know, implicit bias just refers to the attitudes and stereotypes that affect the understanding, actions, and decisions in an unconscious manner. And, and, and so implicit biases that we all have in one way or another are deep into our subconscious that, that is over a period of time mm -hmm. is learned. So, you're, so by that you're saying whether or not someone locks their door when they see a certain person walk by walk near their car or or clutch their purse or yeah or or you're in a classroom and you assume that a certain group of people are going to get the better grades because they were is that what you're speaking about with um, implicit bias? yes uh, but even that can be you know for one you know for instance implicit and explicit are um, uh, are not mutually exclusive mm -hmm. But uh, I would say yes, but it depends on that person, it depends on that individual, because it's a learned process through your early childhood experiences, you know, viewing and just even passive, casual um, observations. Like, for instance, if for your whole childhood, all you've seen were white police officers, you would you start to create these implicit associations that um, African Americans can't be part of that power structure. You know, can't be a police officer or, and that, you know, that uh, these are the people that have these positions, you know, your, your politicians. And if, uh, if there's no diversity there, then that child can assume that, that these people, that uh, African Americans or other uh, ethnicities are a lesser than because they're not in positions of power. But that's built implicitly, that's built in the subconscious. Can, so, go ahead. I just, well, can, can you, can, can you unlearn, I mean, you know, people think, well, this, so, okay, there's implicit bias, mm -hmm. and this is in your subconscious. Yes. Can you do anything about it? It yeah. could be unlearned. Okay. Um, but what's but it you, going to take? What's and, it going and, to take to unlearn it? What and how do you, and some, because some people, if it's, if it's unconscious, some people wouldn't even recognize right. that I even have this bias. Right. Okay. Um, I don't know exactly for sure. That's, you know, that's really a question for our, um, uh, senior researcher Cheryl okay. Statz who's working on it but she did produce an incredible book okay. called the uh, the state of the science implicit bias review this is last year's um, but so this can year's they go online yes they can go on okay. the Kerwin Institute .osu .edu, and they can download the implicit bias review and it's very detailed it talks about implicit bias in housing talks about implicit bias in education talks about implicit bias in employment and how it works and how it can be, and how it can be remedied, how you can unlearn this. Mm -hmm. So um, it's so we have all the information there. Cheryl Stats and our executive director Sharon Davies, they're um, pretty much in tour mode across the country, right. giving giving that. talks about implicit bias to businesses, um, to um, police officers, mm -hmm. to different, to many different groups. Um, that want to know about this and want to know what they can do. The, the good thing about it is that there's an interest in talking about it and having the conversation and having this dialogue. So. No, that's great. Is this what you saw, so, you know, you, is this what you saw yourself doing when you came to the Kerwin Institute or did you end up, you know, opening up something and go, wow. Well, when I came to the Kerwin Institute, I think I was more of a mode of, is this all I'm going to do? <laughs> I want to mm -hmm. do more. What else can I do? How can I get involved? I really uh, worked hard because, you know, I was never, I guess, into academia like that. I'm just a community person, um, a server, and, uh, I, you know, I like to um, be able to use my expertise in communications to better communities but I said you know what I'm gonna get deep in here and I'm gonna learn what they what they're putting out there and I want to be able to uh, make sure I understand what they do 
so I can communicate it with the public the best way we can and to expand into films, to expand into and to really improve our graphic design because people can also learn in symbols, people can learn in video, people can learn in audio and can we use all of these tools to just create a better society mm -hmm. because we have because we because we have others that use all these tools to undermine good things that mm -hmm. are going on in the society. And you want to perpetuate the yes. goodness. Now you talked about film. Mm -hmm. you, you, you recently put together a film yes. that was quite impactful. And yes. impressive. Thank yes. you. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Tell us about it. Tell, tell us about that. Well, that, that film was uh, um, a reading of the letter from Birmingham jail written, uh, written by Martin Luther King. And what we did was that we, uh, got on the phone, got on the email, and we just emailed community leaders, university leaders to read an excerpt of the letter, and we were gonna film them um, just in celebration of the 50th anniversary year of the letter from Birmingham jail. However, during the filming process, it just wasn't cool enough, and I just didn't think it was hitting home. And I said, well, what if we put the context in the midst of the letter and actually while you're hearing the words and seeing people read it, you're also getting the scenes of that day. Mm -hmm. You're also getting the context of that day. And that's why the film was in black and white. So you experience that day of the emergence of the television. So when you have a good idea, how much time did it take you to get that good idea from your head to the screen? Oh, well, um, it, just as many as you thought or just as many. I, well, just as many as I thought with the uh, push and the pressure from my executive director. <laughs> Get uh, it done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. So I still I'm going to say on record, I still think I'm the um, first person she's ever yelled at. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got you know. it done. And we're glad you got it done because yeah. it was an incredible film. Thank you. And, and nothing great ever was accomplished without some without some strife. And well. it's still and it's still being screened yes. a year later. Oh, okay. I'm doing three screenings. Um, I'm doing one t one tonight at Corpus Christi Community Center. I'm doing um, I'm doing one uh, at Marion County Correctional Facility. And, so, and we're doing one at um, Nationwide Insurance downtown. So they can just get a hold of you to. to yes, they to can have just. Yes, they can go on the website. Uh, um, What's uh, KerwinInstitute.osu.edu, and or they can call six one four six eight eight five four two nine, and um, we can give you links to the film. The film is free. It's available to everyone. Oh, great. It's um, free. Yep, and every school in, the, uh, in in Ohio has a copy, and every library in Ohio has a copy. Well, this is and, and well, this is a great segue because we're talking about the letter from the Birmingham jail and such a, a, an impactful mm -hmm. film that you did. So let me turn back though to Thomas Capps because you were part of the civil rights tour. Absolutely. And uh, this is an annual civil rights tour that our that the, that the Community Relations Commission does in conjunction with the Friends of the Community Relations Commission. Mm -hmm. Tell us about, because the Civil Rights Tour is coming back up, and, and, and Columbus State has been a part of this, you know, with, with their young people being a part of this tour for the last several years. Tell us about, you know, how that, how that went for you. Absolutely. Uh, you know, yeah, Columbus State, uh, they reach out to the students and they say, you know, write us an essay and we'll give you a scholarship to go on this tour. And so um, we've been doing that partnership for quite a few years now. And um, I was given the opportunity to write a scholarship, and I receive it this past year. And... Um, you know, a lot of it's it's like a roller coaster because you you're so excited to go on a trip um, to learn and educate yourself about things. You're reading books, but when do you often get the opportunity to see it? You know, and, and to experience it. So um, how did that compare? How did the books compare to what you experienced? Not even close. <laughs> Just because I mean, you read letters on, on a word or words on a uh, in a book, but and you can educate yourself, but really going to the locations and seeing it and feeling it and experiencing it for yourself, um, it's not something that you can read about. It's now, something... now the tour goes from Columbus to Atlanta to, to or from Columbus to Cincinnati to Atlanta to Alabama, then to Tennessee, you know, yes. hitting several locations. What was the most impactful look? What, what really grabbed you? You know, from the location. Oh man, there's a lot. I mean, we go to like 20 something locations, right. so that's a hard answer uh, to find. But I will tell you that the the number one for me, without giving anything away, because people need to go on the tour and see it for themselves. But when we went to Selma, 
Okay. Um, you know, with the movie coming out, and you know that that is such a historical place. And when we went there, I mean, it was an entire day. You know, from I think what six a.m. or seven a.m. all the way to like eleven p.m. And we we just spent the whole day. You know, walking across, doing the the bridge walk, and yeah, and going to the museums, and um, there's one museum in particular that really puts you in the shoes, you know, and mm -hmm. really shakes you. And so uh, I just know that day I came back, and I think everyone on the tour was just really like, how great, but how just yeah. deep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, and. and and on that tour, yeah, there were several people so deep that that it brought tears to their eyes. Yes, because I was you, one of you, them. You really feel, yeah, you really feel it. So, um, and that's a tour. Um, and for our viewing audience, that's a tour coming up April seventh through the eleventh uh, this year. So get signed up because you can go on our website at www.crc.columbus.gov, and right on the homepage, you'll see Napoleon's face. And uh, on the mark. right, you can click on it and register and get more information. And the flyer is really really nice it's a nice flyer but you got to get registered soon because as you know we, we, we took 50 up. people right right all right well i tell you what we, we we've just got about a minute left so if they want to get a hold of you and get some more information in regards to what you're doing there at columbus mm -hmm. state and get involved in some of these programs what, what number should they call uh telephone number 614-287-2426 um that is our executive director's desk so um any questions they have can be answered there or they can even visit um cscc.edu backslash campus life, backslash diversity. And right. Everything's there. Excellent. Thanks, Tom. Jamal? Uh, CarwinInstitute.osu.edu, or they can call 614-688-5429. All right, excellent. Well, you know, this is this. I uh, appreciate your time here. We've learned so much, and I'm sure we could, we could ask a, a thousand more questions, but <laughs> we are out of time. Uh, our next big thing with, with celebrating Dr. King and, and the history and legacy of, of those uh, during that time uh, is the Civil Rights Tour, which is April 7th through the 11th. Get on our website, get signed up, get registered. The seats are going fast. We only take 50 people. Um, and so for more information, once again, www.crc.columbus.gov. We can call our office, too, at 645-1993. And once again, Mr. Tom Capps, I'd like to thank, thank you for Tom. being a part of the, so part of the program. Me. And Jamal Bell, I'd like to thank you for being part of the All program. Right, thank you. And Ms. Tony Bell, thanks for being by my side. For all of those out there, have a great week and take care.